Hello, Saddleback. Good, good to see you. You know, uh, in hugging uh, thousands of you during Easter week, one of you generously gave me your three-week respiratory virus. How generous. Thank you. I'd like to give it back now. And so if you'll meet me after the service, you know who you are, because you've probably still got it. So, <laughs> You know, <clears throat> if you'll take out your message notes, life can really wear you down so that you've got nothing left to give. And I'm sure that every one of you at some point in your life could identify with this anonymous prayer request that came in. I feel like I'm in a war zone. It's just one battle after another. I argue with my wife. I clash with my kids over everything. I fight to keep my job. I struggle with our growing debt, and I'm losing the battle with my weight. And then there's the conflicts inside me. I fight my own fears, and I battle with my anxieties and my temper, and I'm always fighting off depression. And sometimes I'm just fighting to keep my head above water, and I'm just so tired. How does the goodness of God help you when you feel like that? When you're in the battle and you're all beat up, how does God lift you up when you're worn down? Not after the battle's over. I'm talking about in the middle of the battle. Where do you find the, the goodness of God? Now, we've been in this series for, now this is our eighth week on living in the goodness of God. And we're looking at Psalm 23, the most famous chapter in the entire Bible. It's only six verses, but it gives us 12 pictures, 12 expressions, 12 identifying factors of God's goodness in your life. How God is good to you, whether you're resting in green pastures and by still waters, or whether you're in the valley of the shadow of death, or this week when you're facing an enemy, wherein you're in a battle, a financial battle, a health battle, a relational battle, a, a, a battle for your own sanity. How does God show his goodness in that kind of situation? Well, today we're in verse five. And in verse 5, there are three more pictures of how God is good to you. We're only going to look at one of them. For the next three weeks, we're going to look at one. This is such a deep passage, and the metaphors are so full that we're taking literally one phrase, not even one verse at a time, one phrase at a time. And so we're going to look at the first phrase in Psalm 5. It's at the top of your, excuse me, verse 5, at the top of your outline, and it says this. You prepare a banquet for me in front of my enemies. Pretty simple statement. You prepare a banquet for me in front of my enemies. What in the world does that mean? I mean, this was written over 3,000 years ago. So it, how can it help you in the battles you have against your enemies this year? Well, we're going to tear it apart first word by word. And uh, to understand this metaphor... Uh, you need to ask four questions. We're going to ask, um, what kind of banquet is it? We're going to ask, uh, who are the enemies? And then we need to ask, uh, what does this banquet symbolize? And then we need to ask, what's on the menu? So let's get right into it. First, what kind of banquet is this? Well, again, let's just take it apart word by word. He starts off by saying, you prepare a banquet for me in front of my enemies. You the word you means God. He's talking about God. So write this down. Five things we know. God is the host. God is the host of this banquet. So whatever we're going to look at today, it's God's idea. He is the host. And can you imagine the honor of getting an invitation in the mail where God says, I'm inviting you to my banquet. You'd be on an A-list. You probably wouldn't even go to bed tonight. You'd stay up taking a couple of showers, getting a haircut, whatever you can do, find new clothes so you'd be ready for a banquet that God has invited you to because he's the host. Then it says, you prepare. Now what that means is this is well prepared. This is well planned. Write that down. This is not a spontaneous banquet. It's not off the cuff. It's not like, hey, let's go down to the beach right now. <clears throat> God has put forethought into us. This. this is planned. It is prepared. 
It's not of the spur of the moment decision. Now, I want to tell you that the word banquet in a lot of translations is actually in Hebrew the word table. And King James Version says, you prepare a table for me. But it's not just any table. The Hebrew word here is the word shukan, and shukan literally means the king's table. When he says, I prepare a table for you, a banquet, he's not talking about a TV dinner tray. He's not talking about a formica dinette in your kitchen. He's not talking about a folding table. That you just, this is one of those really long tables you see in a castle, in a medieval castle, it's long, holds, you know, 50, 100 people. It's the king's table. It's the queen's table. The, this word in the Bible is used almost always to refer to a king's table or it is referred to the table of showbread in the temple. So it's a special, it's a sacred uh, table that you're being invited to. And it is well planned. It's all laid out. It's big, heavy, and it's got the king's feast on it. He says, you prepare a banquet. The next phrase is, for me. Here's what you need to write down. You're the guest of honor. So write this down. I am the guest of honor. This is not a banquet for somebody else that you're being invited to attend. This is a banquet that is really just for you. It's you and the king. You're the, you're the guest of honor. You're the big cheese. You're the big deal. And so it is for you. You, I am the guest of honor. You prepare a banquet for me and it says, in front of. Here's the next phrase. It's a public banquet, not private. You're, people are going to watch you eat with the king. People are going to watch you. It is public. It's not in secret. God wants to see you honored. And God wants everybody to see you being honored. So this banquet we're going to look at today is for you. And it's to be in public. It's not a secret event. It's in front of, and then the last phrase, which is the catch, in front of my enemies. Oh, no, that's a twist. I might say, think God would say, I'm going to prepare a banquet for you and your friends. No, he says, I'm going to prepare a banquet just for you, but all of your enemies are going to watch us eat together. What in the world does that mean? It means that it's on a battlefield. Write this down. The banquet is on a battlefield. This is a banquet not just when good times are going in your life. It's when you're under attack. The king says, during the battle, I'm going to come and throw a banquet for you, and all of your enemies are going to watch me honor you, bless you, and have peace with you. So that's what the banquet is. Now, the second question is, uh, what, who's the enemy? And I, I could go into this. This could be a whole sermon. We've talked about it before. I'm just going to give you uh, the fill-ins. I've written some verses there. I'm not going to even teach on these because I don't want to spend most of the time on it. But the Bible says you have three enemies. They are the world, the flesh, and the devil. You might write these down. The first enemy you have is the world around me. The world around me. And I've given you some Bible verses there to look the world is in opposition to God because it worships itself, not God. And the world around you is always coming after you, always um, you know, criticizing you, uh, always not understanding you. If you've ever been picked on, if you've ever been put down, if you've ever had injustice or bias or racialism or prejudice or overlooked because of your gender, that's the world around you. The second enemy you have is Satan is against me. The world is around me, and the second is Satan is against me. And again, I don't have time to go into all of this, but God says that Satan is real and that he wants to defeat you. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Satan hates you and has a terrible plan for your life. And the Bible says that God, Satan wants to kill you. Satan wants to destroy you. Satan wants to defeat you. Why? Well, he doesn't even care about you. The only reason Satan hates you is because God loves you. That's why you're the enemy of Satan. Because God loves you. And Satan hates anything and anyone God loves. Because God loves you greatly, Satan hates you. Satan wants to hurt you and destroy you because he thinks that'll hurt God. If you wanted to get at me, get at my children or my grandchildren, you would hurt me the most that way. So you've got the world around you, you've got Satan against you. But then the third enemy, and this is the biggest one of all, is my old nature inside me. That's your third enemy. 
your old nature inside you. And the older you get, the more you're going to learn that your biggest enemy is you. And you don't always do the right things that you intend to do. You have good intentions. Paul wrote an entire chapter about this in Romans 7. He says, the things I want to do, I end up not doing. And the things that I know are bad for me, I end up doing. I'm in this battle constantly. And that's the third enemy against you. Now, he says, in the presence of my enemies, I do a banquet. What does this banquet symbolize? Well, it symbolizes two things. In the Bible, a banquet almost always represents two things. Write these down. First, God wants and welcomes fellowship with me. That's the first thing that this banquet says, that God wants to hang out with you. He wants and he welcomes fellowship with you. This is one of the most amazing truths in the universe, that God, who created the whole thing, wants to know me, wants to know you. God wants to be your friend. God wants you to be his friend. God wants to fellowship. He wants to eat together. Let's go get something to eat. That is an amazing truth, that in the Bible, a banquet almost always represents fellowship. You know that. When you want to fellowship with somebody today, you say, let's go get something to eat. You have somebody over to your house, that's fellowship. When God throws a banquet for you, he's saying, I wanna hang out with you. I, I want you to understand how much I love you. And he wants to show how you are welcomed by him, how you are wanted by him, and he wants to do it, listen, when you're under attack, to encourage you, in the presence of your enemies. When everybody else is coming against you, God says, I wanna throw a party for you. I want to have a banquet for you. Psalm verse, chapter 5, verse 11 says this. You welcome us with open arms, talking about God, when we run to, for cover to you. In other words, you're in a battle and you need a little protection and you run to God. He, God says, I welcome you with open arms. I love this in the message paraphrase, Psalm 511. You welcome us with open arms when we run for cover to you. Let the party last all night. Stand guard over our celebration. God says, I know you're in the heat of the battle right now. You're fighting for your job. You're fighting for your health. You're fighting for your sanity. You're fighting for your dignity. While the battle's going on, hang on, I want to throw a banquet for you. Just a little encouragement here. Now, it's a party in a combat zone. It's a banquet in a battlefield. Now, I want you to use your imaginations to, to imagine this scene. Go back to like, Robin Hood days of knights and vassals and kings and, and courts. And, and imagine a giant medieval battle. And there's two mountains and this team A over here and team B over here. You're on the good side and this is the bad side. These are the evil people. And the, the enemies have come out uh, and the, the soldiers have come out to fight this battle. And just imagine that you are a soldier on the front line in a medieval battle. And you're out there and you're fighting hard and you're working hard and the enemy's coming against you. It's a heated battle and you're tired and you're sweaty. You probably got some blood on you and uh, you're scared and you're hungry. And all of a sudden word comes up without explanation and an, a superior officer pulls you off the front line. You're going... I don't know what's going on, but I'm glad to get off the front line because this is a hot and heavy battle. And the superior officer pulls you out of the battle and you start walking back <clears throat> and about a thousand yards back off the front of the battle, you see this giant banquet tent has been erected with all the turrets and the flags and it's, it looks like a, like a circus tent, a big tent. And you go, what's going on? And as you start walking toward that banquet tent, uh, you realize, and there's a full feast there, you realize that the king has showed up. The king of the empire has shown up. And, and when you walk into that tent, there is the king's table. And it's, it's 75 feet or 50 feet long, and it's heavy and wooden. Somehow they figured out a way to get it out of the castle and transport it directly to the battlefield and this is the king's table. Only the, the fancy people, the, the noblemen get to eat at this table. 
And you walk in there, and the table is decked out with all your favorite foods. Comfort food. Now, when you're in the middle of a battle, nothing tastes as good as coming home to some comfort food. And you walk in there, and this table's covered, and it's just you and the king. Just the two of you. That's it. And all this food. And around the tent have been stationed about 500, maybe 700 guards. So there's no way the enemy's getting in here. But the tent flaps are up, and everybody can see what's going on. It's not hidden. It's public. Everybody sees that the king has called you out of battle, brought you back to this giant banqueting tent, put on the feast of your favorite food, and it's just you and the king. And everybody sees it. And then the king says to you in a loving voice, this is all for you. I, I, I made this for you. I planned it for you. And uh, I, I, I just wanted to hang out with you. I love you. I miss you. Uh, and I want to affirm you publicly in front of both of these armies. And I want you to eat all you want. And uh, you're unhurried, unworried. You're protected here. There's no way the enemy can get to you. Uh, and I just want to affirm you and have some fellowship with you. You think you're in a dream world. You know, how does the king even know me? I'm just, I'm just a servant. I'm just, uh, I, I'm, I'm just a soldier. And then, so everybody knows what's going on, the king orders erected a giant banner outside with your name on it. And the, the banner says this, I love, and it has your name, and it's signed, the king. So everybody knows what's going on. This is a personal recognition, a personal act of love. I love you, your name, and I am proud of them. What I just described to you is exactly what God is talking about doing for you. For you, do, doing for you. You prepare a banquet for me in the presence of my enemies. I'm the guest of honor. You're the guest of honor. It's not for anybody else. It's not like you get to look on. It's not like you're uh, a, a wedding crasher and you just came in to get some food. No, this banquet is in your honor. And the banner clearly says, because it's got your name on it. This is what God wants to do for you in the battle of your life. Look at this verse up here on the screen. Song of Solomon says this. He brings me to his banquet table, and his banner over me is love. You may have never thought that God was proud of you, but if you're a child of God, your heavenly Father is proud of you, and he loves you, and he brings you to his banqueting table, and his banner over you is love. He wants your whole enemies to know how much he, the king, loves you. Now, go back to this picture. The enemy are fighting, and I, they see this going on, and all of a sudden, they just stop the battle. And both sides are looking at this event taking place up here on the hill, because it's public, it's not secret. And the enemy is absolutely dumbstruck by the scene. They're, they all stop fighting, and they just stare. And they go, are you kidding me? The king picked that one guy and brought him out. And they just stare. You know, I have learned personally that when God wants to bless your life, there is nothing that critics can do about it. When God wants to bless your life, they may spite you, they may slander you, they may ignore you, they may ridicule you, they may... Uh, libel you, they may say all kinds of mean things about you, but they can't stop God's blessing on your life. They just can't do it. And that person at work who wants your job and is trying to push you aside, if God wants you to have that job, doesn't matter what they want to do. And if they are having a, a tough time with you getting over here in this area and they're trying to stop you, stop you, when God's blessing is on your life and God's banner over you is love, it doesn't matter. They cannot stop what God wants to do in your life. They are powerless against the king. 
and your enemies are dumbfounded. God loves to show the blessing of his people in front of the enemy. Now, today, let's talk about you. In, in, in your battle, in the middle of your battle, God is inviting you to a banquet. I'm going to explain it in just a minute what that banquet is. But he's inviting you to a banquet. Job chapter 36, verse 16 says this. God is gently calling you from the jaws of distress. What a picturesque phrase. From the jaws of distress to an open place of freedom where he has set your table full of the best food. The same metaphor. Job's saying the exact same thing David says in Psalm 23. It says, God, while you're in the middle of the battles you're in right now, God is saying, hey, come, come over here. Come over here. I, I've got a banquet for you. He is, he is gently calling. He's wooing you like a lover. He's coaxing you. This is all done in love. Right now, God is tenderly calling you to his banquet. I highly recommend you accept the invitation once you understand what it means. And he says, God is calling you from the jaws of distress. Everybody remember the movie Jaws? Doon, 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 doon. Yeah. I love this, the jaws of distress. Let me ask you, what's chewing on you right now? What's eating you up right now? What is it that's got you worried, anxious, fearful, and it's just gnawing, gnawing, gnawing? You're, you're stressed out about it. You are in the jaws of distress. God said, hey, come on. You deserve a break today. Come, come over. I got a banquet for you. God is gently calling you from the jaws of distress to an open place of freedom where he has set your table with the best food. And as I said, others may criticize you, attack you, demean you, dismiss you, disregard you. But God wants to hang out with you. That's the first thing this metaphor, I prepare a banquet for you, means. God wants to fellowship with you, and God wants to feed you, to give you some new strength so you can get it back in that battle. You're tired, and you're about to fall over, and you need God's strength, and you need sustenance, and you need nourishment, and you need refreshment. He says, it's all there. It's all laid out on the king's table, and I've transported it right here to the battlefield for you. He says, I put a lot of preparation in planning this. And I want to honor you. So God wants to welcome and fellowship with you. Now here's the second thing the banquet means. Write this down. It also has another picture, and it means this. God wants to bless me to show the world his goodness. God wants to bless me so he can show the world his goodness. You are a trophy of God's grace. I am a trophy of God's grace. I don't deserve the blessing on my life, but I don't deserve anything. It's all by God's grace. You don't deserve this banquet, but God says, I just want to do it because I love you. You are exhibit A of God's grace. You are God's goodness on display. Look at this next verse, Psalm 31, verse 19. Your goodness is so great Remember, we're studying the goodness of God. Your goodness is so great, you have stored up great blessings for those who honor you. And you have done so much for those who come to you for protection when you're in the middle of a battle. Blessing them before the watching world in the presence of mine enemies. God says, I want to bless your life so all the people can look at you and go, wow, that girl is blessed. That guy is blessed. I want that. How are they blessed so much? How are they blessed so much? Well, they have a good God. They know God. And he says, those who honor me, he says, I have stored up great blessings for those who honor me. Now, I want you to circle those two words, stored up. It says, God has stored up great blessings for those who honor you. Stored up indicates advanced planning. It means that God plans 
what he's going to do for you before it actually happens in your life. It's stored up. It's planned in advance. It's not just spur of the moment. You know, I just thought it up right now. God prepares a banquet, prepares in advance a banquet for you in the presence of your enemy when you're in the battle. Okay, let's apply this right now. You know that battle you're going through right now? The, the, the tough one you're going through right now? And it's a white knuckle, you know, bare, bare hands thing you're holding on like on a roller coaster for dear life. And you don't know if you're going to win this battle or not. Financial battle, physical battle, relational battle, dignity battle, moral battle. Whatever the conflict's going on in your life, those jaws of distress... You know, that battle, God says, I prepare a banquet for you in the presence of your enemies. He had stored up the blessing. It means that battle you're fighting right now, which is very intense, before it even started, before you even got in that battle, God had already prepared the victory celebration. God has already prepared the banquet. God has already prepared the celebration party for the problem you're in right now. Because he knows everything. He knows how it's going to come out. You store up in advance great blessings for those who... You just keep honoring God with your life, with your body, with your business. You keep honoring God with the way you think, with the way you act, with the way you talk. And even though everybody's coming against you, you just keep honoring God. God goes, I already got the banquet planned. It's already stored up because you're going to get through this with my help. God loves to throw victory celebrations for his children. Psalm 35, look here on the screen, verse 27. How great is the Lord. He is pleased with the success of his servant. I love that verse. How great is the Lord. He is pleased with the success of his servant. God loves to honor you, and he is pleased with the success when you, when you succeed, of your servant, when you are his servant. That's what God wants to do in your life. So my last question then is, what's on the menu? What's on the menu of God's banquet? I want you to write this down. Everything God has promised in his word is on the menu. Everything that God has promised in his word is on the menu. The menu are the promises of God in his word. Now, by many counts, one estimate is that there are about 5,500 promises in this book from God to you. Have you eaten any of them? Have you eaten any of the 5,000 plus 500 promises of God to you? The banquet is sitting right there. Your banquet is in your Bible. Everything God has promised to do your life is in this book. If you're not reading this book, you don't know squat about what's on the menu. All of those 5,500 promises are there. This book is full of fruit and bread, and all kinds of meat, and milk, and drinks, and wine, and uh, sweets, and lots and lots of desserts. <laughs> the Bible calls, God calls the Bible the word of God. It calls it the bread of life. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The Bible calls itself the meat of the word, the bread of the word, the milk of the word. The Bible says it tastes sweeter than honey. The Bible says it is fruit. The Bible says it is fulfilling. The Bible says it is tasty. And over and over and over, all of those terms, banquet terms, describe the Bible itself. And you can have a feast anywhere you've got one of these. You can be sitting in a bus stop and pull out a Bible and start having a feast right there of all the things God has promised to do in your life. And your anger goes down and your fear goes down and your anxiety goes down. The reason why your anxiety is up is because you're not in this book. You don't know what God's promised to do in this book. Now, if God has provided a feast 
a banquet in this book. Why would you ever go eat internet granola bar? <laughs> when there's a feast laid out for you. And you're reading the newspaper more than you read this. You're reading magazines more than this. You're reading social media far more than this. And that's starving you while this would be feeding you what God has laid out and promised you. The Bible says this in Psalm 145, excuse me, 119, verse 103. The promises of your word taste sweet to me. They taste sweeter than honey in my mouth. You got a bad taste in your mouth? How much time are you spending in this book? If you're not spending any time in this book, you got nothing in your mouth but gravel. This, this is the feeding. Are you fasting or are you feasting on the word of God? Are you fasting or are you feasting on God's banquet that he's laid out for you? All the stuff he's promised to do in your life. You can't do them if you don't know them. God never shuts his blessings until you shut this book. When you open this book, every day you need to be feeding and eating from it, from the banquet of God. Now how much time are you literally spending in this book? Not very much. You say, well I go to church once a week. How would you do if you ate one meal a week? I'm feeding you the word of God right now. But if you ate one meal a week and it was a banquet and then you fasted the rest, you'd be anorexic. You wouldn't be very healthy. This is not, what I'm teaching you is not enough. You gotta feed and feast on the word of God every day. This is where you get your strength for the battle. And if you're not getting your strength from the battle from this book, you are failing in your battle. Because you don't simply have enough strength on your own to face all the crises you're gonna hand. I'm telling you as your pastor who loves you, you've got to get in this book every single day of your life. It's the banquet. And if you don't have it, then you're not, you're not growing. You're not being healthy. You're not being strengthened for the battle. So what you need to do is go get a modern translation. Don't get, read one of those books with the these and the nows and the Elizabethan English. There are tons of modern translations. You go, oh, that's what that means. And we've got them out at our bookstore. We can help you choose one. And then go take class 201 again, which I wrote, which teaches you how to have a daily feast with God. And you've been through that class and you've forgotten what it's all about. Go take it again. Take class 201 again so you can learn how to feast on the word of God. Psalm 34, verse 8 says this. Learn to savor how good the Lord is. Do you do that? When you read the Bible, do you savor the word of God? You say, no, no, I don't. I just kind of do it as a, well, I ought to do it. Okay, listen very closely. Your view of this book, what you think it is, will determine how much you enjoy it. Okay, how much you enjoy it. If you think that this is a textbook, like this is God's textbook for us, does anybody ever enjoy reading a textbook? Not unless you're a nerd. <laughs> no, I hate reading textbooks. And if you think that this is a textbook, you're going to go, I don't want to read that anymore. I want to do any other homework. It's not a textbook. If you think it's a history book, well, you know, it's got some great stories in there. History of Israel and history of Jesus and all that history stuff. Do you enjoy reading a history book? Not many people do. It's not a history book. If you think this is an insurance policy, it's your fire insurance policy, keep you out of hell. Okay? 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 This is my fire insurance policy, I better read that. Or, or this, if you think the Bible is a life insurance policy, how you get eternal life, how you get to heaven, have you ever read an insurance policy? No, you have not. <laughs> Why? Because they're boring and dry as all get out. And you go, yeah, yeah, just show me where to sign. <laughs> so if it's a textbook, if it's a history book, if it's an insurance policy, whether it's for hell or heaven or whatever, you're not going to read it. You know what this book is? This book is God's love letter to you. It's a love letter. His banner over me is love. When Kay and I got 
Amer uh, engaged many, many years ago, we did something really dumb. We got engaged and both moved to the opposite sides of the world. We lived in California. She moved to Birmingham, Alabama to work in an inner city African-American church, and I moved to Nagasaki, Japan to plant a church. And we were separated almost our entire engagement. Now, in those days, we didn't have cell phones, and it cost 15 bucks a minute on a regular phone to call Japan in those days. It was very expensive, and we were dirt poor. So we only had one alternative, write letters. And I wrote a letter every day. She wrote a letter every day, and the way it would stack up, I'd get her letter before she got my response to the next letter, and my letter was talking about something. She didn't get it until the next one, and we're always having out of sync because of the letters. But that was the highlight of my day when I lived in Japan. When I got a love letter, you think, and somebody said, hey, Rick, you got another letter from Kay. I said, well, put it there. I'll read it in a couple days. Are you kidding me? The moment that love letter writes, I would tear it open, and I would read it, and I would reread it, and I'd try to read between the lines. <laughs> and I'd underline it, and I'd want to memorize portions of it. And I'm going, I'm trying to gather every drop of love from this woman for me out of this letter. And I'd read it and reread it and reread it. This is God's love letter to you. It's got, this is not a book. The Bible is not for everybody. The Bible is written for God's children. And that's why when somebody who doesn't believe in God tries to read it, doesn't make any sense, well, that's what you get for reading somebody else's mail. Okay? Okay? It wasn't written for you. This is God's love letter to his children. If you only do one thing, you start reading the Bible every single day. I'll tell you what to start. Start with the book of Luke this week. Start with the book of Luke. It just tells about Jesus. And start reading through that. Your view, if you're not in this book every day, you are forgetting how much God loves you. And you're forgetting what's on the banquet table. And as a result, you're stressed out. Because you think it all depends on you. You don't know what's covered in the policy. You don't know what God's already promised to do. The banquet is in the Bible. Now, one more thing. This promise, you prepare for me a banquet in the presence of my enemies, is a both a now and later verse in the Bible. Because right now, while you're in the battle, you can have a banquet any day you open this book. And it'll give you strength for the enemies in your life. But there's one day going to be a literal banquet for you in heaven. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And let me read it to you. Isaiah chapter 25 says this. Here's how it's going to happen one day. History is moving toward a climax in heaven, and one day there's going to be a party in heaven, a giant banquet for all of God's people who honored him and trusted him. And it says this, Isaiah 25, 6 to 9. The Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of the finest food for all peoples. Now, doesn't matter what your background is, doesn't matter what color your skin is, doesn't matter what race you're in, no cultural background, doesn't matter what religion you are. If you have put your faith in his son, if you have trusted God, if God has accepted you into his family, so this is for everybody, no matter what your background is, the Lord will prepare a feast of the finest food for all people, a banquet of the best of meats and finest wines. And on this mountain, God will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples and the sheet that covers all nations. What's a shroud and what's a sheet? A shroud, a shroud literally, is what they put over dead people. It's a covering. You would, they would, like a mummy, they would wrap a dead body in a shroud. It's a covering of death. And the shroud that this is talking about is the gloom that spread all over the earth because we all know we're all going to die. We're all going to die. And that, is, that, that brings the, our attitude. No, we're not going to live forever on earth. And that's the gloom that hangs over everybody. Everybody knows they're going to die one day. God says he's going to destroy that shroud of death. And that enfolds people, and the sheets that cover all nations. What's the sheets? That's, that's the crowd of grief that we're all under. 
because things don't work right. Everything's broken on this planet. God says one day at this banquet, I'm going to destroy that last enemy. I told you you had the enemy of the world, the flesh, and the devil, but you have a fourth enemy. The Bible calls the fourth enemy death. And the Bible says in Scripture, death is the last enemy to be defeated. And it will be defeated on this day. And there will be no more death. And the Bible says this, he will swallow up death forever. No more death. Nobody dies after this. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. And he will remove the, the disgrace of his people from all the earth. What's that talking about? The disgrace of his people is all the put downs you've had for being a believer. When people have put you down for standing for truth. When people have put you down for doing the right thing. When people have put you down for claiming to be a follower of Jesus Christ. That's the disgrace. He said he's going to remove all the disgrace of his people. Why? By having a banquet in front of all the enemies. He said, I love these people. They, they put up with all kinds of stuff at the office and at work and at home, but they loved me more than they loved you. And he says, he will wipe away their tears. He'll remove the disgrace of the people from all the earth. And in that day, they, that's us, will say, surely this is our God. We trusted him. And he saved us. Yes, this is the Lord. We trusted in him. So let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. And the eternal party will begin. Let's bow our heads. Have you met Jesus? Have you accepted his salvation? Or are you still trying to fight all your battles on your own power? How's that going for you? How's that working out? A little frustrating? God has planned a party for you if you'll just trust him. He's planned a banquet in the middle of your battle, no matter what it is. I'm going to pray a very simple prayer, and I invite you to pray it again with me, maybe for the 5,000th time. Some of you, it'll be for the very first time. Just say this, thank you, God. Thank you for your goodness to me. Even the stuff I don't recognize and don't even notice. Thank you that even in the middle of all my battles, you want to you give me a banquet. You want to make me the guest of honor. And that's not in secret, it's public. It's on the battlefield, and even my enemies have to watch you honor me, and they can't do anything about it. Lord, I'm not doing too good in my battles right now. The world's around me with all of the pressure and stress, expectations. And Satan's against me, and he's always suggesting me to do the wrong things, trying to trip me up. And then my old nature inside of me is at war with myself. And you know, Lord, I often do stuff that I don't really want to do. And I don't do the things that I, I know are good and healthy and right. And I'm tired in the battle. Thank you that you want me. And thank you that you welcome me into fellowship. Lord, it's hard to believe that you, God, would want to hang out with me. That you would love me that much. That you'd, you'd go to all the expense of preparing a banquet for me. When I run for cover to you. Lord, I read that verse today that said you're gently calling me from the jaws of distress. I'm coming. I'm coming right now. I'm running straight to you, Lord to that open place of freedom where you've set a table full of the very best food. Thank you for loving me. And Lord, thank you for wanting to bless me to show the world your goodness. You've already done so much for me. The air I breathe is a gift. That you want to bless me before the watching world. And I want to be blessable. I want, I want to put my trust in you. 
Jesus Christ. I don't understand it all. Forgive me for going days without looking at your word, the Bible. Everything you promised is there. The banquet is in the Bible. And I want to commit to not going to bed at night without feasting a little bit on the banquet. All those 5,500 promises that you've made. And so I'm stepping out of the battle right now. I'm walking into your tent. And in the one-on-one fellowship, I want to receive your love. And I want to learn to love you back. I humbly ask you to accept me into your family. In your name I pray. Amen. Thanks for checking out this week's message on YouTube. We would love to get you connected with our online community. There's three easy ways to get you involved. First, learn about belonging to our church family by taking Class 101 online. Second, you can join an online small group or a local home group in your area. And third, check out our Facebook group to engage with our online community throughout the week. To take these next steps, visit saddleback.com slash online or shoot me an email at online at saddleback.com. I hope to hear from you soon.